Well, I gone full stupid and bought myself a tow truck. <laughs> uh, first of all, welcome to the new subscribers of the channel, as well as the veteran subscribers of my channel. We got ourselves a new toy for the channel. It's going to need uh, a heck of a lot of work, but I'm incredibly excited about it. It's a home 600 split boom wrecker body on a 89 international chassis, an S1900 as you've already seen by the title of the video. I love this thing. It needs a heck of a lot of work. And there's a lot to go over. So, let's just begin. See, um, see how much of a money pit it's going to be. <laughs> We picked this thing up out of Colorado. My dad and I, we flew out there and we uh, was able to purchase the truck. It looked good enough for me at the time. <laughs> and we drove it, uh, what we call hot seating it in the uh, commercial driving business. We hot seated it back home, about a thousand miles back home and uh, ran and drove pretty good, uh, very solid. We got about 10 to 13 miles per gallon out of the beast. Um, does have the DT 466 motor. We'll get to that in a bit, of course. It does have a lot of nicks and dings. We'll zoom in a lot closer, but uh, it technically does function as is. Um, usually, I don't even know where to start. Here, you know, let's just just walk all the way around. Let's start with the the big, uh, the big stuff here. Everybody, say hello to the Toyota. Um. The one feature I really like about this is it has the sensory wheel lift, right? So not only can I tow old school cars with this, I'm missing my tow bar, unfortunately. That did not come with a truck. I'm kind of miffed about that. But I not only can I tow old school stuff if I have my tow bar, I can haul modern plastic cars with plastic bumpers with the wheel lift. So very, very versatile. Um rig now you might be saying to yourself why do you even need a tow truck well mostly for pulling cars out and transporting them now you may ask yourself okay why don't you just get a flatbed then and i says well i struggled with that for quite a long time now i talked to several people including sort of george garage they might actually like lacing up my laces here. Gotta look pretty for the camera. It just comes naturally, but you know. So I asked my boy, sort of George. No, I told him. He told me. He told me off. No, <laughs> he's a good boy. Go check his channels out. Link is in the description below. Partner channel. Um, now I consulted a few people on flatbed versus wrecker body, and I. I went all back and forth for six months on what style to buy. Flatbed would be nice. Roll on, roll off, snatch and go. Fairly easy. But I talked to two of my coworkers who are both former tow truck operators full time. They actually did it for a living. They were paid for it, so they are technically professionals. And I presented them with a scenario, and uh, one of them was very insightful as to pros and cons of each. Flatbeds, you can flip cars and stuff right side up. I mean, if you know how to do your rigging and you got the right equipment, it's really amazing what you can do with flatbed tow trucks. But he also pointed out, you know, if you actually get a, a boom truck, you can do a whole bunch of stuff that you can't do with a flatbed. And I says, oh, well, educate me. And he says, well, imagine a scenario where you need to pull an engine from a car, lift the hood up from a car, you want to pull stumps at the farm or fence posts, just run your cable down there and then winch it up. And I thought to myself, oh, that's a pretty nifty idea, actually. Or if I'm working at the farm, dad needs help with the baler. If he needs something jacked up to be welded on, I literally have a mobile crane at my disposal plus I just love the way that these old homes wrecker looks and they're super reliable all mechanical no muss no fuss so for picking stuff up and down you know engines or hoods or whatever having a little mobile crane I think is really awesome 
and further to that point, let me split the boom and I'll show you the swing out on it. Give you a little bit of idea of what you can do with it. So with these Holmes wreckers here, with this particular body style with a split boom, you have right here the release that swings out. Oh, well, if I started the truck up, it would actually swing out. This will actually swing out 90 degrees. In fact, actually, let's do that right now. I need to lift the boom up. It's gonna hit here. What the heck's the crank for this thing? Wants to hit my bracing here. Another nice feature is you can actually raise and lower these booms. I guess we're just gonna get right into the body, <laughs> the wrecker body itself <laughs> operation. Oh well, it's gonna show up on camera, but basically this boom's gonna hit right here, so I need to raise it up just enough. So, this is a homemade cobble up handle. Absolutely hideous. In a pinch, I guess it'll work, but we need to build ourselves a proper one. So, that means about maybe five or six years from now. <laughs> right, let's see here. I'll do the other one right quick. So now we can swing it all the way out. Up to 90 degrees, I believe. We can go past 90 degrees. It's like uh, 120 degrees, actually. Stay, stay, so there you go. As you can see, you can easily pull up a, a car here or here, ample room to pull anything out. In fact, you could probably reach another foot or two if we open up our door. I wanted to lower it down some more. Now I had a hard time judging of how far out that was when I was researching this going on YouTube and whatnot. So I'm gonna count the paces out and see how many feet out. That's a good four or five feet out there. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'd say about five feet, about five feet out, which is really impressive. You can easily pluck anything out, out from underneath there. Initially, I was kind of disappointed because Holmes did make it a, an extend boom flavor of these. But uh, this doesn't have it, but five feet out there, you can easily pluck something up. Not a problem. Um, well happy with at least the design concept. As far as the physical condition of this thing, it's not so good. I'm going to button this thing back up here right quick and I'll, uh, we'll show you how bad the booms are. They're, they're in pretty poor shape. What you gotta do, we gotta put the center of that in between the center of that. And then your pin pulls, and that's how it locks. It's kind of a pain if you gotta separate them, but at least you got the option. Tighten up our cables.
Shut this thing off again. As for the booms themselves, something very bad happened here. You noticed how cobbled up those welds are. Not good. Someone has attempted to repair this. I mean, there's, I mean, I'm not a professional welder. I did go to school and learn a little bit of welding. See that pitting right there? That's not good. You can notice right here, you can see the wire from the MIG welder. Absolutely awful. Something, something, something bad happened here with these booms. Notice how wavy this one is right here. Let's see how it pulls in. That's no good. And even the welds right up there look absolutely atrocious. Even I, a silly monkey, could do a little bit better of a job, I'm thinking, than that. The other side of the boom is bad, if not in worse shape. Again, we have absolutely poor welding here. Very porous. It looks incredibly cold. Nothing's flowing. I can give you perspective. That's how it's supposed to look. That's factory original right there. Or if it's not somebody did a darn good job. That's how it's supposed to look. That's awful. Another telltale sign something happened. This main brace has been thwacked. Something, I don't know. Let's get another side view of it, or back view. Something happened. That's what's supposed to look like. That's what we actually have. Someone took a torch to it. You can see the hammer marks on it to beat it back straight. I don't know what happened. I highly doubt someone was pulling on it to make it bend like that. I really doubt it. I'm wondering if something just simply slammed and fell on that brace and these booms. Although it'd have to be an awfully heavy piece to, I would think, to ding that up. I, I, I have uh, no story on that. Uh, previous owner could not tell me anything on that. Very discouraging. When I got home and took my rose-colored glasses off after driving a thousand miles and bonding with the truck. <laughs> but uh, another big problem is... These pipes, these sections. Now, I'm thinking, I'm not a Holmes expert, but I'm thinking this should be one long tube, right? And obviously tubes are better than square because uh, with a tube, a circular design, you can distribute the whole load over the, or the entire force all over the entire tube and not put uh, stress, like if you had a, a square tube, it would put stress just on certain areas. With a round tube type, all of the loads constantly dispersed so it can handle a lot more stress and i think of a square tube of a similar size although later i think holmes i know holmes went to a square rectangle tube what was that in the 80s i think but that's not here or near there anywhere the design is good however this thing has been patched up after some horrible incident i don't know what it was we're going to have to either find new booms, or new used booms, obviously Holmes is not in business anymore, or we can go, go get a good donor set somewhere, um, which some people still selling these, just the Holmes flatbeds themselves. I don't have money, nor resources, nor a welder to actually fix this proper, so I pretty much decided this will be for light duty use only. Um, this should be rated 8 tons per boom, so it's 16 ton record total pulling power. We're not gonna do anywhere near that much on this channel, at least right away. <laughs> um, I'm just pulling cars basically out of the rut. I'm not going up to like, you know, Canada on the Coquihalla Highway and pulling semis up the hill or retrieving them from a ravine. This, this, this truck is just, the booms, in my opinion, will be too weak to do that until we can get back up to full strength. Um, we're just going to have it light duty use only. As far as pulling cars, you know, up out of its own ruts, you know, sitting for 20 years or something, that's one thing. That should be fine. Um, and if we have to, we can run both winches just to make sure we don't hurt ourselves. But the booms are in a very, very poor state, unfortunately. I only really noticed that after I got home, but, you know, flying out and driving back a thousand miles you're pretty much committed on 
more or less buying it. <laughs> I don't have any regrets, but she's gonna need a lot of the work. Now let's take a look at some of the accessories that actually came with it and the shenanigans <laughs> that that's gonna entail. So we have wheel grids, came with wheel grids, came with the L-arms, and some very worn out wheel straps. Um, there might be a rating sticker on there, but these are so old and sun-checked and faded. Um, I'm gonna have to get new ones. I could probably use these a couple more times, but very sketchy. And again, other side, other wheel grid, other L-arm, and uh, another wheel strap that's in pretty poor shape definitely when you're buying something like this people you gotta check out the equipment first <laughs> and I checked it out and it's pretty awful um as far as how to use this equipment <laughs> this is gonna be a little teaser I'm actually going to uh, probably do a little bit of demonstration on a recovery that we're gonna be doing with this truck another rescue another will it start running after actually it won't but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to take a lot more work, but that is a little teaser, and you'll see these in action later. All right, and we got a set of axle forks and axle fork holders, I guess you would call them. Um, these are mismatch. You notice that style, and this style is different. We got safety hooks on here. I don't think this thing even has safety hooks. What you do is you put those over the tube, and then you get your forks. <laughs> Like here, like set something like that, more or less. And then you can tow big rigs with this. The big axle will fit between these two forks. Stay. And then your axle fork then will go like this. So you can haul big, big stuffs with it. Now we got a problem with these forks. Back up to top side. Oh, so I get done giving myself a hernia. No. Oh. These two are okay. Nice, thick forks on the sides, very good. The two inner ones here, someone actually cut a cutting torch and literally just cut these down. <laughs> um, this is awful. I honestly, I probably would never use these. I would rather get a proper set. If I had to use them, then maybe put some bracing on here. But as you can see right here, as you can see right here, perhaps, it's starting to come out and bend out. It's because it's been incredibly weakened by somebody literally <laughs> to take, taking a torch to it. Taking a torch to it. Um, so honestly, I don't think I'll ever use these. That would be unsafe in my opinion. Maybe a light pickup, but pretty much no more than that. I would not trust it. As for the other equipment itself, Cables are, I would say they're almost junk. That one doesn't look too bad. This other one is worse for wear. We've got strands that have already snapped off. Our hooks are missing our safety latches on both sides. So that's not wonderful. The cables have not been wound correctly, in my opinion, for quite some time. This is supposed to go all the way one way, then all the way back. It needs to be, what, what would you call it, um, load wrapping. You basically need to load wrap it. Basically, you unspool all your cable and you pull it back under a load and get it this cleaned up nice and tight. Helps to prevent wear and tear on the cable as well as, you know, not putting any stress like that on there. See how these cable here and that the under the cable there and over the cable there. That's 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 not good at all. That's that's awful. Someone did not keep this up. As well as over here, this is just it's just all wound up. It needs to be all be drugged back out, then sucked back in. And the same on the other side. We got cable overlapping here, cable overlapping here. That That's not good for the cable. Again, produces a high pinch point there. And uh, that's how you get to start f stuff fraying. And of course, cable and spots is frayed. 
for me doing light automotive work recovering from like a, a field or something not a heavy rescue but just a, a regular pull fairly flat this cable will technically work but i will be very mindful until i can actually buy myself some new cable and or synthetic rope which actually i've been told is actually stronger than cable and my mind's still trying to get my head right around, wrapped around that concept but this thing's not going to be this thing's probably going into semi-retirement mode with my uh, channel thank goodness but <laughs> glad i could save it while i still could this is the holmes gear box this is where the pulling power comes from pto's run off that chain we'll take a look down up below it is a little bit greasy so someone was maintaining it for a little bit either that or the seals are leaking <laughs> uh a little bit of grease there a little bit of grease there so it's had a little bit of grease but still honestly it's looking a lot a little drier we'll have to do some periodic maintenance we'll have to do some maintenance on it that's for sure it did come with some wheel chocks you put those behind the duels on the back of the rig so if you're pulling really hard um basically put those uh, you might be able to call them cleats they have a little bit of teeth there put the cleats down for additional grippage like um, like if you're on snow and ice on a road it does have also this uh for those axle fork holders it does have someone made a homemade uh stinger on here and uh honestly i don't i don't i can't use this i mean look at those welds these welds are so awful there's a hole blown right through the weld on that one and that's just all goobered up. I mean, this that that's not safe. We'll have to build our own receiver and or buy one. Um, that's just totally 100% unsafe. Uh, even in the condition, honestly, that is just totally unsafe. I'm probably just gonna throw that right in the scrap bin because that's that's just I don't I want to avoid temptation. I just don't want to use it. <laughs> As for up top, we have some whoopee lights here and here. I'd love to trash those immediately and get something else. But technically they do work but what this needs is we need to put the original light bar back i don't have it something like a federal that goes the full length here um the old uh, the old the old incandescent type um it's screaming to have this on here <laughs> hey, look those two little strobe lights look absolutely pitiful <laughs> in my opinion and then maybe on top i'm thinking is we'll put a light bar maybe across here and maybe i love to have two slow Rotating beacons here and here with some maybe uh, floodlights in between here. That would be really cool, but that's dreaming right now at this point. <laughs> it does still have the original Beehive clearance lights, two out of three lenses. Fortunately, they still make reproduction ones of these uh, with an LED style, so we'll keep the same style, which is vintage correct. Uh, this Wrecker box, I believe, is, well, I think it's mid late 70s. And, um, you know, this is error correct. In fact, these are probably the original, but they do make the upgraded LED version of the Beehive's clearance lights is what these specific style is called. What I'm most disappointed about is we don't have our Holmes 600 badge on here. There's two holes here, and two holes here, and two holes here. And that is where the Holmes label, model label, is supposed to be mounted i thought oh man that's a darn shame i looked everywhere it doesn't have it so at some point we need to put our name we need to get a name plate on here it does have cool cool two uh little led floodlights i don't think they've ever worked as for the wheel lift we do have a control box with it you'd plug it into here and then you could press up down to lower the rear wheel lift the only wheel lift it has <laughs> up down and the uh, boom goes in and out i got this thing to work once this thing's trash <laughs> i tried to plug it in uh, again and it didn't work this is beat up so more content i suppose um over here we have nerve central um we got lights, that's a seven pin, not the RV style, but that's a semi truck style, as well as the four pin for tow lights down below here. These I assume would be your glad hands, your emergency glad hand and your service glad hands holes. 
if you're towing like a fifth wheel trailer behind you, like a box fan or you know whatever required air brakes to release. Again, this is the one option why I decided to get a truck that's got factory air brakes. We have onboard air right here. So I can just hook up my air hose and psh, fill tires up with air or my own tires on the tow truck if I had to fill them up. That's where the uh, connection would be. So if I need, or if I need to run pneumatics, you know, an impact, I'm, you know, I could run it right off of here. So it is a very handy feature. Again, that's why I wanted to have a truck that had air brakes. Now I talked to a couple of guys and they, one guy actually preferred juice brakes, as they say. Um, that is where you have hydraulic brakes instead of air brakes. Because I guess according to him, you can actually have more feathering with your hydraulic brakes versus air brakes. You know, it wants to, it wants to grab a little bit more. Now, obviously, I'm not doing this on a professional level, more or less the hobbyist, keeping the old iron alive. So air brakes, I'd rather have air brakes, so I've got onboard air. Plus, they're easier to air brakes are easier to work on, at least versus juice brakes of this truck of a truck this big that it would have. In my opinion, I think that pretty much covers the operational portion of the wrecker box. Um, we're missing both mud flaps. I ripped this one off, so that's going to have to be welded and remended. DOT will not like that. They will uh, write me up for that 100%. And uh, the previous owner ripped the other one off. <laughs> uh, we do have backup lights or work lights. I've never seen them work. So we got plenty of wiring to do. Mm. So for this wheel, if that's where the remote control lifts it up and down, you know, get the hydraulics going up in there. I don't have the safety pin that goes through here to lock this up. I've seen different homes wreckers that do have the pin that goes all the way through in case, I assume it's because when you have a hydraulic failure, um, that pin will, is just a safety catch. I know and now in modern days with hydraulics, they've got a little coupler you can put in line with your hose next to your cylinder. And if your hoses were ever to fail, it quick shuts the hydraulics so your ram won't bleed out, so it won't come crashing down. Kind of like what you have on service cranes and overhead cranes as a safety. Uh, I'm pretty sure this thing doesn't have it. And judging by the looks of it, that has been absolutely smashed and used and abused. I don't know. You know, I thought about this, and the other one's just as bad. It's all smashed up. I'm wondering what they did is they just didn't take their hook and just hook it in here and use that as a safety, which it would work, but definitely not correct. <laughs> it'll, it'll get you home, but uh, yeah, we're going to have to figure something of that sort out later. Might have to go get maybe just even a couple of clevises in the meantime. As far as the wheel lift itself, it's plumb worn out and or used and abused. Um, the pins, I don't think these came with bushings. Guys, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Um, I was doing a lot of loring in the past three or four months on these things. <laughs> um, I think there's a bit of slop in there, eh? <laughs> now, I'm sure there's accountability for a little bit of sloppage, but that seems a little bit on the excessive side. Um, yeah. There's some more concerns I have with this. We'll go ahead and stick this out and drop this thing down. I'll show you. It does have a pin keeper, whatever, pin plate, retainer plate, retainer plate, that, that's probably it. There, these are cobbled up, look absolutely horrible. Um, they're awful. I'm thinking that might be a one pin deal, but I don't know if there's bushings in there or not. That's just, I might do some quick off, off camera welding up just to, Get these to bolt in. Now I can show you what I believe are the originals. That would be there. You notice you have a greaser here. 
That is good. That means you can grease the pins. Meaning you can squirt grease around here. Um, I don't know what happened to these. I don't know the story on this lift at all. But um, there's been a lot of cobbling up and uh, none of this is right. This is, this is kind of sketch. Um, I'll probably do some work off camera. Because I know I have at least one uh, recovery for you guys. That's going to be a, uh, <sighs> rescued after 17 years. Uh, multi-part series uh, hoses look fairly newer they're gates and they look a little green so they were replaced I think at some point I don't know if those are original or not uh, yeah looks like the the Rams not leaking right now <laughs> so I'll take that at least for the win too bad everything else needs to be rebuilt um, I love what he did Previous owner did with the truck, he put some 11 arc 24 and a half inch tires. Now, 24 and a half inch tires are old school tires. Generally speaking, nowadays, Everett's running, running 11 R22 fives, which is what technically is on the steer axle. 24.5s are old school stuff, but I like 24s, especially for this application, is because, well, they're taller, which makes your engine turn. Less RPMs. Now we're not talking a whole lot, maybe 100 RPM, maybe 200 RPMs, not a whole lot, but I do like having a big, big, bigger tire on there for that purpose. Now, we also have another problem. As I was pulling it in to do this walk around and tour, and you see this grass is stuck right in here. Well, my brake's locked up. Just a slightly tapping on it, getting it back here, and, um, so I backed up and then went forward and it released itself. Well, <laughs> you guys thinking that I wasted a whole bunch of money on here on this thing, but you know what? You gotta start somewhere. All right, for the heavy mechanics out there, you know what this looks like. Yes. See all these streak marks going here for the uh, people who may not know what they wanna look for. See all that leaking around there? Guess who's got a wheel seal out? Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner, Johnny. Looks like um, we blew out our wheel seal going home. Well, we haven't blown it out because it's still leaking oil. But <laughs> I don't know how much oil is left in the pumpkin. And you really can't see it, but, but by judging the inspection cover, the shoes are wet. Very, very wet. So we're going to be having to do some wheel seals on this in the not too distant future. Maybe a winter project. Fortunately, though, the other side doesn't show any signs of streaking. It's all high and dry. So um, at least that's going for us, I guess, for what it's worth. Now, with regards to our wheels, we already have another problem here. Bless the previous owner for putting 24-inch tires on here. That saves me having to chase down 24-inch rims. But he put one... Aluminum rim on the outside, the inner rim is still a steel rim or a steely rim. When you put two dissimilar metals together, they don't get along and tend to oxidate and corrode and do a whole bunch of nasty stuff to it. So uh, we're going to have to end up one of these days, not a big thing, is swap out this inner steely rim with all aluminum rims, inner and outer. It's not a big deal right now, but that's... In my opinion, that's generally taboo with trucks that I drive. That's 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 not kosher. That's that's not right. <laughs> that is our solenoid pack for our wheel lift. That's the only hydraulics that are on this truck. And as you can see, there's a big old nasty mess. Nice and juicy, and nice and fresh. Um, yeah, as you can see, also by indicated by that hose. So we got a whole bunch of hydraulic leaks we need to fix on the block. That's lovely. Um. Basically what happens is hydraulic pressure goes in and those electronic solenoids, you tap the switch and those activate and that allows fluid to be diverted to whichever circuit you're working on to actuate your hydraulics. The next thing that's wrong is our love joy coupling. That's actually what it's called. It's actually named brand. Uh, we had a lot of these in the fertilizer industry. Uh, put them on our... Uh, 
Drive fertilizer spreader buggies on the spinners and the PTO shafts and that fun stuff. Basically right here, there's supposed to be a rubber spider gear or yeah, a rubber spider that transmits power from here to here via the rubber cogs in here. And as you can see, that rubber cog is gone. And there's really nothing much else they're holding it. So this is, so this thing's probably about ready to let go. So just to give you a powertrain flow, PTO gets kicked on via the transmission. Power comes back to the U, through the U-joint drive shaft. This goes to the uh, Holmes winch box right up there. That's where the wrecker gets its power from. And the wheel lift gets its power from the continuation of the drive shaft coming into this Lovejoy coupling. And there's our hydraulic pump exclusively for the wheel lift. That's apparently the control box is leaking on that. So when that thing lets go, we may or may not have hydraulics depending if um, <laughs> these metal teeth start smashing into each other. So that's gonna have to be replaced. Top of the list again. <laughs> you joints look like they could use some grease, but we'll do first service later. We're just we're just uh, thumping the tires. So I guess since we're under the belly of these, let's take a look forward and see what's going on over here. Oh look, we have a slobbering engine and transmission. Huh, who knew? Well, it appears to me that somebody has an output shaft that is leaking on the rear of the transmission. I don't know how easy to do this with these Spicer 7 speeds. And we'll have to look at that. It's easier, I think, for me right now just to dump more oil in it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's going to be fun in the sun. Probably to figure out. So, probably the rear seal is leaking. And of course, our PTO from our transmission is completely goobered up and juicified and uh, looking a bit moist, which is not a good thing at all. Um, so there's that, and I'm guessing my rear main seal is shot because it's leaking up a good storm right there as well. Wunderbar. This is a lower mileage truck, quote unquote. And what you're looking at right here is not the oil pan, but the oil pan shield. The real old oil pan is right in there. How about, that? How about that? It still has the uh, shield protector on it. That's kind of cool. Um, he recently uh, did an oil change on it. So we don't have to worry about that for at least oh, 7,500 miles, maybe 10,000 miles. I'll probably swap it out maybe next year just for funsies. So even though the truck only has 200,000 miles on it, yeah, it's going to be leaking because it's an old truck and it, probably all the seals are original. So you really can't knock it for that, honestly. It's just, she just needs TLC. I knew I was buying an old truck. Fortunately, I knew I was not going to be driving it every day. So I'm not too terribly concerned about that. I just might have to pull the whole PTO down. Oh, that's going to be lovely. Future content. The one thing I like about this truck is the batteries are actually back here. And why I like that is that means we have dual fuel tanks. One 50-gallon tank here and one 50-gallon tank here. So we got basically 100 gallons of fuel, which would give us about... If we're empty, say getting 10 miles a gallon, which is fairly, fairly generous. Theoretical range is, you know, 800 miles. So I'll definitely, definitely take that any day. I'd rather have two dual tanks and a, than a set of batteries up front. But um, in case I want to do some long range hauling, which I highly doubt I will. So the exact mirror on the opposite side would be our hydraulic reservoir tank. Now as for the box itself. Uh, the original Holmes box would have ended right here. You can see where it curves. Um, from here back on would be the Holmes 600 deal. Um, cubby hole does not go through. It's just uh, two shelving on there. Uh, with some Holmes, you would actually have a 
outrigger you can manually pull out here you could simply open up this door and the outrigger would come down and you know, set it all up in case you want to do some real naughty pulling with it It'd be nice to have that but i really would never probably need that i probably at least would rig up a side pull split both booms anchor something over there then pull whatever it is off of over here or vice versa but not too terribly worried about that this box is the century box another telltale sign is well it's got a century handle on that one and you still have the Ernest Holmes handle over there so that tells you where the Holmes box end and where the century put in their box now what I like about this though is that this one is a through tunnel shout pull this over here what I like about this is you can put, you know, a whole bunch of lumber, long lengths of lumber, you know, a chainsaw, um, dollies, dolly wheels, if, when or if I ever get those. Uh, you can stash them up in here and lock them up. I really do like that. Now let's talk about the biggest issue with this truck. It got a bit mushed. No, not by me, the previous owner. I had to tell my insurance company about it, so... They knew I wasn't doing any weird uh, <clears throat> shenanigans with them. Um, when I bought this, believe it or not, that door did not open, which is actually going to be the next video in the installment of this rig. Uh, I basically hacked it up just enough so you can open the door. Previous owner said in Colorado they got some steeper, um, steeper ditches. I guess he got caught one in the middle of the winter, you know, driving on the winter road and uh, slid into, I don't know if it's trees or rock or an embankment, something like that. And he smooshed the whole cab in here. And obviously on the top, and it caught, obviously it foobarred it all up. And I think that's where the crack in the windshield comes from. Right down to about there. So the big elephant in the room it's going to need a cab replacement one day. Now, I'm not driving this every day. More than likely, it's going to be sitting most of the winter. So I'll just maybe put crash wrap on it or blue painter's tape, depending on how bad that's going to leak. I still have to fab some of it up. I might do a little bit of minor welding just to make sure there's no leaks. But the door does open and shut. Still locks. And the window does roll up and down all the way. But there is no replacing just parts of the sheet metal. That, that, that's a whole cab replacement. Um, which is almost kind of a good thing if I can find a donor motor, or rather a donor truck that actually has factory air conditioning, because this does not have um, factory air in it. We step inside here. Normally... For this chassis model, you would have a third slider here for your air conditioning, and the vents for the air conditioning would be here, right over here, right where our CB radio is. And yes, that actually did come with a truck. That's a Galaxy DX 959. What's nice about this is it's got low, low side band and upper side band. So you can be a real super trucker and talk to a whole bunch of people, which we might actually do someday. Um, there's a thing called DXing. A uh, long distance talking on CB radio. That is actually still a very, very big thing. No one hears about it. I don't think. Some people may not know about it, but uh, if you look on CB, D, X, I, N, G, um, you'd be surprised. There's people with only, you know, 100 watts talking to people from Europe, Brazil. Um, I've heard a few people on the East Coast before. I couldn't talk to them because my radio's not powerful enough. Not this one, but my other truck that I drive but it's a thing so we might get that tuned up and uh, get it working properly now what's fun about this truck radio is they turn on your they turn on your big old fancy radio get your talker the Robert Roger beep lets you know when you're done transmitting so you're talking like this and then when you let go 
tells the other guy it hears a beep but lets you know you're drone transmitting some people think it's annoying but <laughs> i love it personally just to annoy people on the cb because it's a lot more fun than uh, twitter or facebook or instagram <laughs> anyway that I, i'm just an old school person so deal with it so you get on here and you go like um breaker one seven breaker one seven this is rubber duck to pig pen come on there's your throwback to cw mccall back to the 70s there for you so you're gonna have this one doesn't have an echo but it's got a roger beep and you go like this you go like audio 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 and you'd be one of those annoying truck drivers who have absolutely has nothing else to do with them do with their life come on <laughs> anyways lots of fun i don't think there's a cb hooked up in here at all um that might be the clearance light i don't remember um so we're gonna have to put a cb antenna on here one day so we can be a talk to the big boys we do have an upper side band and lower side band as well as a roger beep radio so shoot i'll take that for the win probably send it into the shop and have it tuned up professionally but <laughs> anyways um what do we got we've got um an eaton fuller no that's not eaton fuller it's a spicer seven speed and there's our shift pattern i hate these seven speeds to be honest with you four and five could be a real bugger especially four for me it can be a really hard pill to find now why they basically this is to replace the five and two uh, meaning five-speed transmission and a two-speed rear end. You would shift regular five-speed, and then you would have a high and low, pretend that doesn't exist, uh, and another separate control on the shifter. It'd be, you know, traditionally it's a red lever right here. You pop it up for high or push it down for low. I can't remember which one it is. Basically, that controls your two-speed rear end in the back. The Spicer seven-speed was basically the answer to replace that. So everything is, all the gearing is now within inside of the transmission. There's no split axles anymore. I personally would love to rip this out and put a nine, 10 or a 13 speed in here because you have a seven speed and an H pattern. These gears are so freaking close together it's really hard sometimes to find fourth or fifth gear, especially when you need to get going really fast. Like if you pulled out on a blind corner from a driveway and you need to get going. Sometimes it can be a real pill to find uh, fourth and fifth for me, sometimes sixth with this particular transmission. It's just the pattern is so tight. You just move just a little bit to find the next gear, and sometimes it's a right pain. Um, um, I honestly would like to prefer to have a Eaton Fuller like a... Uh, RTO or an RRTO, that's one overdrive or two double O's for two overdrives. Um, RTO meaning has one overdrive gear, I believe, and the RTOO has two overdrives. So the 9, 10, or 13 speed, or even 18 speed, whatever flavor you want. Uh, basically, you go back to your standard five pattern that's nice and spaced out, they can shift it easily, but you have a selector here, which on old school ones is right here for direct lower direct and overdrive or uh, more modern ones the high and low range is flipped right here you do your one two three four five flip up to high range and then simply do one two three four five all over again so that'd be six seven eight nine ten and high speed in my opinion i like that because then the h pattern spread back out it's easy to find the gears you don't have to worry about all this being crammed in so much no you're just being a sissy Mm, well, no, no, not really. These these seven speeds, it was a nice try, but you get all these gears in a one H pattern. You gotta cram that whole pack together, and uh, honestly, it's just it's just horrible for shifting. But <clears throat> anyways, little rant there. Toss that aside. We do have a stereo. Um, he put some half decent speakers in here. Does have Bluetooth. There are the speakers down below. I do pretty good, honestly um what else um here's the controls so since the remote's not working this is for the wheel lift hoist so down up in and out um that's where those controls are pto and then we got a pto indicator here this may have been i'm sure this is just a, a factory century box containment box because the pto 
does click on something. I don't know what, but this is how you actually control your PTO by shifting it in and out here, yeah. which I'll demonstrate later, probably in another video. Floodlight, auxiliary light. Now the beacon lights do work. Let me zoom in. Can I see them blinking a little bit there? Kind of blinking a little, focus. I'm blinking a little bit right there. Better than nothing, but we need more lightage up in there for sure. Uh, the truck runs great. Like I said, it's just got over 200,000 miles on the clock. Yes, this gauge cluster needs to be cleaned. Someone's put too much next service stickers on there. <laughs> What's nice about this truck is a lot of times with these older trucks, the needles start to bounce because the cable, speedometer cable gets dry. This one's actually fairly smooth. We'll do a whole ride along one of these days. Um, but it does really good. Um, if we make sure we're in neutral here. Start up. Pops right off. I don't need, actually, I don't need my PTO anymore, so we'll just kick that off. I think also I have a throw up bearing that's going. You hear it growling. That kind of goes away. Yeah, I'll probably gonna have to drop the transmission at some point. Hush. Hush. We got 60 psi at I 60 psi of oil at idle, but mind you, it's a cold engine. I'll shut the truck engine off here in a second, but I just wanted to show you guys show show it's running to you guys. Obviously, we need a new alternator because look how much it's flinging around. Purrs like a kitten, I can tell you that much. And for the 466 nerds like myself out there, who love these engines. This is marked the 210 horsepower edition, which looks like there was a 185, a 240, and 210, so we we're right in the middle of the road. That's just fine for what we're doing. Looks like our breather neck is leaking a little bit, of course. But honestly, it's fairly dry, at least up top. No major leakage around the injection pump. It's pretty, pretty dry. And this is something you rarely see on semi trucks these days. That's your air governor. That tells when the compressor to turn on and off, or rather, when it diverts air to recharge your tanks, as it were. Um, I think nowadays they're either built into the air compressor. I don't know how they wired it nowadays. But this one's obviously newer, so that's kind of nice that someone had to throw in a new <laughs> uh, governor. And when these don't work, either your air compressor is running all the time which one of my former co-workers had that problem uh he had 170 180 psi in his tank he's worried about he's gonna blow those tanks but he was able to make it home he is a little bit nervous so they fail either they're whether fully on i've seen it where it's fully on or they failed and it fails to kick on the air compressor or rather it fails to recharge your air tanks fortunately you just carry one of these in the back of your truck and none the wiser again so keep it simple stupid <laughs> i would like to swap out the antifreeze at one point i did check it's getting warm now i don't want to if i want to open it um it does have green antifreeze in it which isn't too bad if it still has um the sea package in it which is the um well basically the anti-pitting formula but where i would still like to swap it out for peace of mind um just in case if it doesn't have that so we don't have pitting on our liners of course, this is the legendary DT-466. Now, working on this thing's a bit of a pig because the last two cylinders are actually located under the doghouse. But honestly, how often are you gonna open up your engine on one of these? <laughs> I wouldn't think very. 
Another thing that tells me this is a fairly low mileage truck, or at least the odometer's original, it still has the splash shields for the engine compartment on here. You actually can remove these to actually get in more accessible to the engine compartment. Obviously the insulation is mostly gone, but all you do is pull a pin right here, and there's a hook. You just simply, I don't want to do it because it's kind of a, not too much of a pain. And there's the other part of the hook. You just kind of pull it all out. And therefore, it gives you easy access to your engine bay. The insulation is completely falling off, <laughs> or it's, it's on its last legs. I need to get all that buttoned up too and or put new foam down or acquire some that could be fun. And we'll have to work on that. I think the earlier DT-466s did not come with it, but for this particular body style, I call it the school bus body style of the 80s, um, my particular flavor does come with a factory intercooler for the turbo. So I do like that. That's a nice good package right there. We do have a power steering leak. It's kind of oozing down there. That's the coolant filter. Uh, the biggest problem on this side of the engine would be the alternator. Somebody put a GM one wire alternator on here. Now, it's simple to wire up. You'll be good to go, I guess. But for a bigger truck like this, running lights and stuffs, I honestly prefer, we need to put the original back in here. Either, um, wait, how do you call it? The Lavelle Neville, I can't remember how to pronounce that. Uh, or a Delco Ramey, Oh, for crying out loud, is it a 22 SI, I think? Uh, that needs to be put in here. Somebody bent this alternator bracket here. You can see when the engine was running, this thing's just shaking around violently. We drove it back from Colorado like this. We drove it a thousand miles home from it like this. And it never slipped off, but <laughs> I, was, I was getting a little bit worried. You can even see the belt is not sitting fully in the pulley. That's just... I mean, if you're pinched on the side of the road, slap this thing on and go, yes, it'll limp you home, but that needs to be addressed. Turbo looks pretty good. I really don't see any linkage going on there. Fantastic. As for the steer tires, we need new steer tires. They're almost down. There's there's not that much left. Um, it, I like to convert these to 24 inches too, 24 inch tires to match the back. So a trick you can use, if you ever had a blowout, you can at least take one of your wheels off and put it up here if this one blew out, so you can at least drive home. It'd be nice to have all match all six tires uh, the same size in case you have to do that. The odds of that happening are probably, rem you know, I wouldn't say remote, but it's not gonna be a common scenario, I wouldn't think, especially if you get proper, good, made tires. This one's almost done. We're getting some good rubbing action or cupping action rather on the side here. That's gonna have to, the camera's probably not picking it up, but that's gonna have to go. And on the other steer tire, we have a plug right here. Obviously there's a patch on the other side, so it's not gonna be leaking, but he's gonna need some new steer tires in the not too distant future. Fortunately, I'm not driving this every day, so we have time to save up for some money in either put some new 22s on there or upgrade it to a 24 inch, which means I have to go chase down some 24 inch rims too. But uh, how far down the rabbit hole we want to go? As far as this, uh, I call it rear corner fender here. I price these out there about 75 bucks. I might go ahead and replace that because I, I can't hook and unhook my hood latch because that's broken. D again, DOT is not going to like that one bitty bitty bit. So you're going to have to fix that sometime as well the one thing i'm really bummed about it though is we're missing our hood emblem it was stolen previous owner said and it's a pretty cool little badge it's like i don't know inch and a half or two inch by two inch so i'm gonna have to chase one of those down too lovely as far as the grill goes the front is in really good shape the only thing i don't like is somebody put some LED clearance lights on here and to me that ruins the whole chrome. I don't like a whole bunch of chrome 
it, it, it's good like this. I like it. I like the style, but the, 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 those LEDs, those three middle LEDs, I just, I'm not digging it. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this introduction. I got a brand new muddy pit. You guys might think it's unsafe. And to be honest, it's going to need a lot of safety stuff done on it before we can really start pulling on it. So we're going to have to pretty much designate it for light duty use only. I think we're going to have many fun adventures together with it. And I'm just plain stoked. I don't have to borrow any more car trailers from anybody. I can be independent and shovel cars around as I see fit. <laughs> I really love these old international body styles. I grew up with the grain truck tandem axle, same chassis or same styling. It was a gutless piece of junk, but it was a heck of a reliable, absolutely. So now I'm gonna turn the camera off and think about life choices again and think about what I've done. <laughs> it's a little too late now, um, but honestly, I'm really excited about it. In the meantime, while I contemplate my bank account bills and my credit card bills and all the 401k loans I've taken out to get this purchased, <laughs> uh, check out my boy uh, Sorted George Garage. Awesome guy. I get along with him really great. Uh, he's a Mopar fanatic. He loves his Mopars. Uh, he's currently working on 66 Chrysler. Uh, as of the time of this recording, he's working on his 440 trying to clean it up and get the car going again. So please join him on that saga while I, um, I don't know, contemplate what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> but you guys keep tuning in and that's what keeps me pushing on. So thanks for watching. Welcome to all the new subscribers. And welcome to the new journeys ahead. 10-4, <laughs> Roger over and out, good buddies. We'll catch you on the flip side. And of course the truck's name is Little Tugger. This was named... I think two owners ago and gosh darn it i love that name and we're gonna keep it so welcome little tugger to the swede machine family so i consulted a few people on flatbed versus an actual wrecker body and is my head Ooh, ooh now we gotta raise that up a bit Raise that up a skosh, hmm? Let's be sensible here. Just enough, just a tickle, just a pick, just a touch. People saying I'm touching the head, but we're not gonna talk about that. First, do the walk around first. And welcome to my uh, stupidity. Hazelnuts. They're not ready yet, though. Not quite. So I decided, you know what? For pull, plicking stuff up and un unplucking. Was I even in the shot? Yeah, I guess I was bending over. Okay. So there you go. About an arm's width for me out. As you could, you guys are even in the shot. Yes, all right. But this is screaming to have the original light bar back. Stupid phone. Quit texting me memes. <clears throat> now what happens is, PTO turns on, comes back here, runs the home's wrench box, wench, wench box, <clears throat> you wench, shut this, shut this, now let's talk about the biggest so while I'm 